on it because he passed away way too early. So that's sad. I also knew him quite well because, of course, he had many connections down to Germany, of course, and that was yeah, very sad indeed. So it was a tremendous honor to be invited. Already two years ago, finally we could do it. So <laughs> that's really, really great. Um, I like to thank really, particularly also local organizers uh, for making this possible. My first trip to Asturias, um, really, really nice. Fantastic hospitality. Uh, my tailor will be very happy because <laughs> I think I have to <laughs> increase the size probably by about one. Um, so, but um, thank you very much. It was really tremendous. I met many old friends. Um, I also hope to make some new friends. This past week I was really super impressed by the science that's going on. So what I will take back to Germany is that, okay, all the guys in my department, you're gonna work harder because otherwise we cannot compete with a young Spanish uh, scientist that I've seen. And I really was extremely impressed with medal winners, but also the students and postdocs. So for me, it was great. Unfortunately, because as was mentioned at the end, I have less and less time to spend only on science and go to conferences for three days. That's unfortunately extremely rare these days. And um, I'm glad I was here because I learned actually a lot and that was really fantastic. So now I figure out how to run this thing. Which one is this? This one? Yeah. This one? Great. So, yeah, thanks very much for inviting me to honor these people. Um, I hope I can now um, live up to the expectation that Jesus, thank you very much, uh, just said for me. So, I get nervous as it goes on. But um, what I would try to um, argue here is I'd like to argue for the power of chemistry. Um, chemistry is fundamental, chemistry is super important, and chemistry is important for all of Europe, for Spain, for Germany, for everybody else. And I think. Oh, sorry. Going to get used to this, yeah. So, this is the um, final um, blackboard of this man here, Richard Feynman. He passed away in 1988. When he passed away, he, this was uh, his board. Um, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Um, now, I think we can help a man because we are chemists and we can actually create. We can actually create matter, and this is why I went into chemistry as a student because I wanted to create new things. Now, not to play God or anything like that, I don't want to go there, right? Uh, but basically trying to make interesting uh, molecules. And this man here is Har Gobind Korana, won Nobel Prize in 1968. And he published a paper in 1971, and you look at that, it's only eight pages long, so what's a big deal, right? They synthesized the first gene, a 77 mer um, polynucleotide. Now, this is not the entire story. It turns out there's a series of papers going out to page 500 something, okay? And I did a rough calculation. This is probably about 40 postdoc years that went into making this molecule. And like today, that time already, they had sort of news and views. They call it different that time. But uh, the comment was, this is perhaps the greatest put it force organic and biochemists have yet achieved. Like NASA with the Apollo program, so flying to a moon. Corona's group has shown it can be done, making a gene, and both feeds, flying to a moon or making a gene, may never be repeated. Let me put a name because that turned out to be a little bit wrong, as it turns out. Um, it turned out to be wrong because of a work really of one graduate student and one professor, and it was Marv Carruthers, my PhD advisor, and his PhD student, Mark Matucci. In 1981, they described in a paper the synthesis of DNA on a polymeric support. But a more important paper I don't show here was a tetrahedron letters paper in which they showed a new type of phosphamidite which totally changed the way of how you can actually make DNA because the chemistry works in 99.999% yield. In today's terms, it's click chemistry, okay? But that's very old. Now, I would argue that without this, there would be no molecular biology. And that would be a shame, because we really need molecular biology. But from a chemical standpoint, many of you have seen amazing chemistry, right? It's so much more complex than we do. For you, this is very easy, right? Because you would have basically a nucleophile, and you have to make a phosphate diester. Not a new stereogenic center. Just a couple of bad things. You have four building blocks. You have one <coughs> chemical reaction. You have one possible product. So how hard, how hard can that be? Right? It took, also in that case, as you see, a lot of time to do that. But um, in 1976, I took another example. There were 17 consecutive papers, 29 people worked on 126 mer in that case. Now, if you think about this, undoable, right? All of us, we have to work for a year and uh, trying to, to, to make this um, crazy. So, um, 81 automated synthesis. Later on, uh, just a random example again, they reported two of those molecules, and that is just a footnote. Now, I can tell you, I'm not sure how it's in Spain, but for my students today, 
They think FedEx actually makes DNA. Because he sent an email to a company who said, I need a primer or I need something, and then two days later, FedEx envelope comes and you get the DNA, it costs about 70 euros or something, right? So it's actually very, very cheap. Why? Because the chemistry that Karab has created and the understanding of reaction, I think that is the connection with Barolenga, understanding a reaction is the key. Once you know the chemistry, that is when you can automate. Let's be very clear about this. The automation part is not difficult. That's more like an automated so wrench you're putting in. The chemistry sucks. The automation is not going to work. Okay? The chemistry has to work. The chemistry works. Automation is going to work. So understanding the reaction was the first thing. Once you do that, then you can go and you can actually automate. And this is a company that my PhD advisor is in applied biosystems. You may have heard of it, they eventually got sold for a few billion. Uh, but also, once you can make these compounds, you can then automate that. That is a fully autonomous lab. Um, the Emerald Labs in the United States, humans do no longer touch these things. You send an email, the DNA is made automatically, shipped to you. Humans just repair those instruments and fill the chemicals. And that's the end of that. That gave rise to companies such as Amgen. Because once you could make primers, we actually express proteins. I said no molecular biology, no PCR without any of that. No second generation sequencing, no third generation sequencing without synthetic DNA. So my argument is, I think what they did, the guys with DNA field of, of front uh, crabbers, that's the sort of work that should be honored down the street today in those kinds of places because I think that um, increased the entire field. For me, as a PhD student, it was very clear that if you do good chemistry, you can do interesting biology, you can make lots of money. These are all things that I personally find attractive, okay? I admit it. Um, okay, so, so that's the field, and now we are about 1993, I started my PhD in 1990, finished in 95. and so for me it was quite easy, I figured, okay, polypeptides, Merrifield showed us how to make them in 1963. Uh, peptides are encoded by uh, DNA and RNA, Carabas made automated synthesis of DNA in 80, RNA synthesis in 1995, so the central dogma, DNA by RNA goes to proteins, and proteins then make carbohydrates. And nobody automated carbohydrate chemistry. So as a simple-minded person, I said, okay, so why don't I do automated carbohydrate chemistry? Now, I like to, of course, point out, and all the synthetic chemists in the room, of course, immediately knew that this is a little different, because these are linear biopolymers, and the amide linkage in the phosphate ester are not generating a new stereogenic center. However, when you make glycosidic linkage, there's an H missing here, right? So you have basically a new stereogenic center you're making as you actually also have branching and possibly multiple branching, which means you have to exercise reach your control by protecting groups, that's doable, but you also have to exercise stereo control, and that can be pretty difficult. So I can tell you when I started and I uh, got this job at MIT, some very famous carbohydrate chemists came and they say, that's going to be a disaster, you're going to fail, this is not possible. They were almost right because it only took me 25 years. So January 1st, this coming year, I've been in business for 25 years as a professor. Um, and um, I think we tried our best, and hopefully I can convince you today that we have come a long way, and by being able to make molecules, we have applications in different areas, and I will show you those um, also a little bit. So, carbohydrates are important. I learned it the last few days again, but I like them anyway, as you can tell, so, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today, okay? Forget about this. Um, carbohydrates are a predominant biopolymer on Earth because they are nature's building material. So about 80% of all biomolecules on Earth are actually carbohydrates. Now, trees, right, cellulose is important, chitin makes up these animal shells, but one thing that's often forgotten is, for every kilo of uh, carbohydrates on the surface of the Earth, you have one kilo of carbohydrates below the surface of the ocean. And in all the climate models, for example, this does not at all come into consideration. So in my department, we started about three years ago a major project on marine glycobiology, trying to understand what's going on there because there are thousands and thousands of very interesting organisms that feed on this algae, and this all goes into a carbon cycle, totally uh, terra incognita, not known at all. I think it's a very, very interesting area, but we will not talk about this today. Um, what I'll talk about more today is really that carbohydrates surround us. That is a picture, a, mic a microscope picture of the glycocalyx, but it's a dense um, array of polysaccharides that surround our cells, both mammalian but also bacterial cells. This is a depiction of TB, tuberculosis. It's a very complex mess on the surface. But I'd like to remind you that carbohydrates are also important for signaling. You may not remember it, but when a sperm gets together with an egg cell, that is the initial contact, but it's a carbohydrate protein interaction that shows that carbohydrates, even in cell recognition, are important. So 
If you want to fall asleep not in a lecture, the one thing you may take home is I'm trying to use chemistry to understand carbohydrates. That's my scientific goal. It's very, very simple. Um, so for that, I need to understand one reaction. I adjusted my slides yesterday because I realized that many of you are interested in these really complex reactions by on on um, metal chemistry and cross couplings and all that stuff is really complicated in comparison to what we do. But then again, this reaction is really poorly understood. Oh, boy, it should be so simple. All we're going to have, we're going to have a nucleophile. We're going to have a glycosylic agent that's a leaving group here. And upon activation, you're going to form a glycosylic linkage. So it's really one chemical reaction. So how hard can that be to understand one chemical reaction? So um, the issue is that you have in mammalian systems 10 carbohydrate building blocks. In bacteria, there are hundreds, maybe thousands. Okay, So that makes it a little more complicated. Then you have one additional um, aspect, and that is the fact that you have, as I said, you have uh, two possible isomers, one uh, equatorial, one axial, so you have exercise stereo control, I mentioned that already, and one other addition is the fact that you have future isomers, because in principle, any of those hydroxyl groups can also be coupled. And that means you have to get chemical measures in, in order to control these reactions. But still, I mean, if you think about it, all the chemical knowledge that's present in this room, we should be able to figure this out, right? So how stupid can this carbohydrate chemist be? How difficult can it be? So unfortunately, it's pretty difficult because um, and this is just one example. Uh, we have an activator, you have a leaving group, and you may activate that. And then there's all sorts of weird things going on, all sorts of intermediates that can form. And that's uh, was known. And then you make well, all kinds of byproducts. You can get hydrolysis. You can get a rearrangement of a donor. You can get um, self-coupling. It's, it's a big mess, basically. And uh, then you can also get these two products. Now, that is why most people I talk to in synthetic chemistry is if you don't want to touch carbohydrate chemistry because it's an ugly, ugly business, you kind of have to be trained in that area, and then after many years, maybe you know what to do. And I admit also one of my goals is to make carbohydrate chemistry so simple that anyone who has never made a carbohydrate before can go to an expert system and actually make a carbohydrate. We are not at that stage yet, but I think we're getting much closer um, to that. Now, um, for those who are interested, you can read that paper. It's a relatively recent paper from us, but it sort of summarizes um, some of the things we think about, and the issue is very, very simple. If you have an activated donor that can, in principle, engage in an SN2 type um, reaction, or it can um, also go via an SN1 um, like um, reaction in most cases. The problem is that there are permanent factors in the nucleophile, in the electrophile, sterics, and um, electronics play a role on both sides and conformation. Temperature plays a role, activator plays a role, and the solvent plays a role. So it is a humongous mess. And the way this used to be done is very simple. You have people, maybe I hate to say this like myself, we've done this for a long time, right? And they know how to do that. Oh, if you want to make that linkage, you're going to use this building block, and that building block, and that solvent, and that temperature. That should give you a good result. The student goes to the lab, and then they optimize for a few weeks, and they come back. It's, it's terrible. Um, but basically, um, there's a lot of precedence. And um, actually, that's an old paper. 1893, so almost 130 years old, by Emil Fischer, and he talks about uh, making glucosides of alcohols in Germany. Um, and what he suggested already, the same thing, right? You have an activation of a leaving group, you got a glycosyl cation, which is reacting in short lived, that's going to get attacked by a nucleophile, that's a one-time reaction, that's going to get you um, the thing. 130 years ago, in all the textbooks, but the problem was, this cation was really never observed. We all have it in our textbooks, we all study that, but where is it actually? And his other thing is that they worked on that using our spectroscopy, worked on, we worked on that um, using actually um, uh, low temperature um, IR spectroscopy, and we could actually, then finally in 2018, capture um, such a glycosyl cation. In this case, we could even see a participation of a neighboring um, acetyl um, group. So that shows you that mechanistically, also, this has taken a long, long time for people to actually try uh, to understand all of this. And one of the frustrations um, in my lab. Yeah. One frustration in my lab was that my students were just not productive enough. So don't get that wrong. I have wonderful students, I have wonderful postdocs, they work very hard, they are very good, okay? But the problem in carbohydrates was they had to optimize, optimize all the time, and that's boring, nobody wants to do it, and maybe they can do four reactions per day, but that's it. So I told my students in 2001 at MIT, I said, look, you guys are too expensive and you're too smart, I don't want you to be on the bench all the time just optimizing stuff. I want to replace all of you. They didn't like that part. I said, I want you to actually think about stuff, uh, think about stuff so we can do things in a much better way and also more systematic way. 
and we story flow chemistry of the type. So the frustration was that built an entire program I won't talk about today in my lab, and we have made many syntheses in flow chemistry, but that was really the beginning. It took us only 15, 17 years until the first paper, the first useful paper came out of this one. We published 100 or 200 other ones, which were in other areas, but in Hawaii this took a long time. So by the end of the day, what we have today is a system that runs the design of experiment software, that drives a multiple series of pumps. Uh, these pumps bring the glycosylating agent, the nucleophile, and the activator in. That gets mixed, it gets retained. Output gets analyzed by um, HPLC. Today we have LC mass back in that. The result goes back, and based on the result, the computer picks the next reaction. And that means we can have now high precision of reusability, small volumes that abounds, and we can interrogate 13 different variables. Because the problem was that if one student would do a reaction, and another stu student would do a reaction, we get different results. Not because my students are stupid or didn't do anything proper, just because these reactions are very, very difficult. I've got to show you some recent unpublished results, how really difficult those reactions are. But if you want to use artificial intelligence, if you want to use machine learning tools, we need reliable data. So you need that as a basis for actually trying to think about um, doing machine learning. So what we found out of that, um, basically, is that the temperature contributes about one-fifth to the problem. One-fifth comes from a glycosylic agent, one-fifth from the acceptor, 7% from the activator, and 27% comes from a solvent. Now, those who do carbohydrate chemistry could have said, yeah, I knew that beforehand, but we were actually finally able to quantitate those aspects, and what we want is really to be able to predict, and in that paper, and I won't show this today, in that paper for the first time, we we're actually able to begin to predict the outcome um, of glycosylations. And to me, I, I told my students before, I said, this will never work, but as always, I was wrong, they were right, and they made it work for the day. So that was useful. Now, um, let's leave glycosylation for a second because I want to talk about automatic glycan assembly. I told you the assembly only works if the chemistry works. And what I'm summarizing today is really 25 years of work, and I'm trying to do this in such a way that I can actually get it uh, across and it's halfway understandable. Now, um, the idea is relatively simple. We can have a little plastic bead, polystyrene, on that plastic bead, or also called Merrifield resin. We have a photolabile linker. We put that in a little reaction vial. Then we gotta add some acid because it's better be acidic, otherwise we got a problem. We then gotta add a building block that carries different protective groups, a leaving group. We gotta initiate a glycosylation, and that then makes the linkage between the first sugar and the linker. At that stage, we cap. That means that anything that did not react at that stage earlier will react now so that we can um, prevent is actually the accumulation of byproducts. Then we gotta remove a protective group, we expose the next nucleophile that's now again on the solid support. Everything you want sticks on a little bead, everything you don't want gets washed away and that is not our idea. What is the idea of Merrifield in 1963? He got a Nobel Prize for that idea and we just borrowed that for carbohydrate chemistry. So you go through that process as long as you want, then you expose this to photocleavage in a flow reactor, you um, obtain the material you want, you deprotect the material, and you get this material. So this was um, commercialized eventually, and we have reviewed this um, excessively, so I'm not going to go into details on that. But now I'm going to take in a little dirty secret that usually I don't talk about in carbohydrate meetings. We're going to talk about this today. Uh, because what you can see here is now that until recently, it took us about 100 minutes to put in one sugar. Now just to give you an idea, I worked as a postdoc at a pentasaccharide, where five of us, it took two years to make, okay? So 100 minutes for each sugar, so we're taking us 500 minutes, not so bad. But the problem is my department have only four synthesizers. They're expensive, unfortunately, and I have only four of them, but my students fight for synthesizers. So if I could get the couplings faster, then I could make more sugars at the same time. So we want to make it faster. So what do we do? The glycosylation takes place at low temperature. We have to cool this whole thing. And then it's interesting, we go to low temperature, and then we increase the temperature. Why do we do that? Because we do not really know at what temperature does the glycosylation take place. We know it's somewhere between a low temperature where nothing happens and a high temperature where everything goes to hell, but somewhere in between is that sweet spot. And that sweet spot, the reaction is done in less than 15 seconds. We know that. The problem is we don't know the temperature. But what would be really would be great if I know that, okay, building block A and building block B work together and it's always that temperature, and I tell you that, you could do the reaction very quickly. So that is something we need to figure out and we are in the process. The capping here took 35 minutes and the protection was long. So we said, okay, we can somehow have to actually address this here. But 
As you're doing this, of course, you also want to make larger and larger sugars. Uh, Jesus mentioned it in 2001. We published a paper. We showed we could make a nightmare. So that got larger, but coupling times got longer and longer. So we improved that. Then we train 19, made 100 mer. Use block couplings, make bigger ones. And uh, of course, we raise this on who has got the biggest carbohydrate. Okay, so that is basically uh, what people are going to go for in this case. So um, one of the postdocs in my lab, he used a building block, he put in a synthesizer, and he ended up making a 100 mer. I should say he came in as a postdoc. First week he made a 20 mer. Second week a 40 mer. Sixth week he made a 100 mer. So actually, that really works pretty nicely. So we did analyze this thing. Okay, that's 45. <coughs> A kilodalton, pretty large molecule after deprotection, still 16 kilodalton, quite large. And as good synthetic chemists, of course, you always characterize our molecules um, completely. So that was nice. Then he said, okay, let's make something branch and let's show we can do block couplings. So he synthesized by automation a 30 mer, converted a glycosyl fluoride. Then he takes that um, machine again, he makes a 31 mer that's quadruply branched in this case. And then he does what we at that time called the number of all couplings, 31 plus 30 plus 30 plus 30, give 151 mer, and that was went done. Recently, a paper from China used exactly the same method now. They made a 1080 mer by putting things together. So that's great because it shows that we have the right methodology, but they could also use it. That's excellent. The secret of it is that I showed you so far only manhouses. And we were lucky for two reasons. The first reason is that they work pretty well at this temperature I showed you, and the second reason is they don't form structures. Because you, most people thought that carbohydrates don't form structures, but that turns out to be actually completely wrong. Many carbohydrates actually fold, mannoses don't. This is something I didn't know in 2001 when we started all this, so we got very lucky. Would we have picked cellulose, and uh, that would have been a disaster. But anyway, we got lucky. Um, so, the other thing, of course, for the people who know stereochemistry, and uh, all of you do, you will say, Peter, well, all you showed us so far is easy, because what you're making is you're making translinkages. And with translinkages, you can have a participating protecting group that's going to block the bottom phase, and the nucleophile can only attack from the top phase. So, how about you're going to make amylose? It's also 1 4 linked glucose, but now that's alpha, and that's a cis linkage. So, how about this one? And I admit, for many, many years, we could not make that properly. Not only us, but other people couldn't make it very well either. But what we were able to show in this paper here, Yun Tao Chu, now professor in China, did that. And he showed that if you combine remote participating groups that can actually uh, reach around from the top from two phases plus uh, a solvent, you get an attack um, from the bottom. And uh, we did that to make a series of molecules. And again, I understand you don't see them, but the point is only to impress you to say, look, we can do this. We can make a lot of molecules. And yes, we can if you're interested. Go to paper. So we can make trans linkages and we can make cis linkage. So that's good. <coughs> so um, then we had another issue. The issue was <laughs> that if you go to DNA chemistry, everything takes place at ambient temperature. That's great. You have your synthesizer, every time you make a coupling, three minutes, you get something put in. In peptides, people got a little more creative because they realized if they heat up some reactions when things go faster, microwave assisted, peptide chemistry, two minutes now overall. Glycans until 2021, we took 100 minutes. And because we had only, only from about ambient temperature down to minus uh, 35. The recent instruments now include a temperature range from minus 35 up to plus 100 to also include microwave assisted uh, chemistry. Now, that one is relatively simple. You can imagine you basically take a, um, a refrigerator and you stick it in a microwave, okay? That's what we do basically. Um, and what allows us to do that is to actually go through that and adjust the temperature <coughs> as you will up to 90 degrees. Uh, capping is like 30 degrees, coupling at low temperature, capping at 30, 60, 90 degrees. We can adjust as we want. And we do adjustment quite simply because we keep the chilling always at the same temperature of minus 30. No microwave, it's about a minus 20 in the reaction vessel. We put a microwave on, we put it on more, and we basically heat up <coughs> the whole thing. So we're having cooling and heating at the same time. From an energy standpoint, uh, not so great, okay? But that works quite nicely. So that was important because uh, that was the work of an uh, engineer from Venezuela, Jose Langa Flores, a uh, postdoc in the United States, and a PhD student from Germany. And what they showed is really that we were able to accelerate glycosylations. The capping went from 35 down to 12 minutes. 
left removal in the radar wheel down to 15 minutes and actually things like saltation from basically here nine hours down to 30 minutes. So what it shows you is by using microwaves, we can accelerate these reactions and we can make things we couldn't make beforehand or <coughs> so this time from 10 hours down to five hours and so on and so on. Interesting also, we could now use um, four different types of protecting groups and that allowed us to make things that actually are so complicated they don't show up in nature. So that was a first big step forward. What also happened in the background is something I didn't really talk about too much to you, but in addition to the chemistry, we also had to develop the automation part. And that was hard for us, not because automation is harder than chemistry, I think the opposite is true, but I'm a professor of chemistry, I'm not an engineer. And at universities, that's very hard to do that. So the first instrument we used was an old um, peptide synthesizer, which I bought as an assistant professor at MIT. I bought it for $10,000 used because I couldn't afford a new one, okay? And the automation part was that one of my students or me at night come in and change the cooling, basically. So that was the automation part. Not so good. Then we had the first home-built system at ETH. That system is actually, if you come to Berlin, you can go to a German technical museum. You see that on display now, that instrument. That's the first commercial system that's also uh, in Bilbao. Um, a beautiful uh, piece of engineering in my mind. I didn't make it, so I want to say that. Uh, this is now a microwave system, and actually this year, this is the prototype um, of the new system, and when I get home um, from this trip, I hopefully see the first of a 3.1, um, see a like uh, 3.1 series now that's going to come um, to my lab, and um, they're going to start installing these now, the next uh, commercial version of that. The commercial version is based on, again, work by Jose, and uh, it's smaller, it's lighter, it's faster. Um, that's what it's going to look like, so the whole thing just got a lot smaller. It's like an iPhone, it's getting better every year. And actually, <coughs> this one is also going to get in price, I think, down by about 30%, 35% lower, which is different from the iPhone, if I'm correct. Um, okay. Now, just to give you some sense as to what we can do, I will not now show you all the things we have done, because that's not the point. This really depresses the hell out of me. Because as a postdoc, I work on this part here. Five people, two years. This guy, first six months of my lab, he made 100, 150 more. And then he said, I'm going to make this whole thing. I said, yeah, good luck, buddy. That's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> and um, so he actually made it. Uh, he actually made the whole thing. Um, lucky for him also that, of course, many of the building blocks are not commercially available. But still, this is a really, really nice um, piece of work that he has done. The very sad thing is this is amongst the very best uh, postdocs I ever had. His problem is that he's Christian. And he can't get back to India because they won't hire him. Uh, because they don't hire Christians right now. It's really a terrible situation, so he's probably going to go uh, to a company in Germany. Uh, sad for his family, sad for him to some degree, but that's also a reality we're facing in this century, I think, that uh, religion plays maybe a little more role than it should be in some of these cases. So he's done a tremendous job, and I think this is not the biggest carbohydrate, not as big as the Chinese carbohydrate, but that's really one that's biologically um, relevant. Now, let me go back um, to the nitty-gritty details because I saw so many reaction optimizations and details I thought I'd share some with you. And this is the chemistry I showed you earlier. We have to go to low temperature and then we have this ramp which we don't really know why we do that. And then we have these really long reactions and we just want to make this shorter, right? Because I don't want to buy so many synthesizers. And we want to understand this reaction. And so um, I had an undergrad in my lab. And why did I have an undergrad do that? Because I asked for 10 years, I asked my students to do this optimization. And my PhD students come and they say, Peter, no, we don't do that. We want to make a vaccine, or we want to make a material, or we do something else, but we don't have work on this. This is stupid, and this is boring, and we won't do it. And this is why I use undergraduates to do that, because they don't know any different, right? <laughs> I tell them, you can be very important, you're a fantastic chemist, you're going to do this, and they even believe that, right? And then, great. This guy, absolutely fantastic, full price call from the United States, Owen Tuck. Unfortunately, he didn't stay, but in nine months, he got a first offer paper in Angevan, they came here with the help of some uh, other people, but really fantastic. He works for Jennifer Doudna now, the mm -hmm. Nobel Prize winner in Berkeley. And what he did is something that may seem um, trivial, but basically he said, look, let's look at a building block, different protecting groups, different uh, leaving group here, and let's determine two temperatures. One is the activation temperature, that's the highest temperature when the starting material is still stable. So that's a temperature when nothing happens yet. That's one down here. And then let's determine a temperature when the starting material is completely consumed. If you go above that temperature, that building block is garbage. Don't touch it anymore. So the reaction temperature we want is somewhere between TA and TD in that yellow zone. That's what we want. If you go below, nothing happens. If you go above, hell breaks loose. So we're going to somehow go in between here. And he built 
a device where you could actually always experiment and then determine the outcome. And I won't go into details, I will just tell you that I have now engineering students in my lab who have actually built a completely automated system and now this whole thing is done automatically because I have, don't have so many undergraduates but I can do that and now the instrument can do all this stuff for us. So, I apologize, this is, didn't come out very well, I copied it in there, but uh, anyway, the take home message is not that this is important to you, but it's important that depending on the array of protecting groups, you can have an activation temperature around zero degrees, or you can have activation temperatures way below 35 degrees. What that means is, if you have always the same coupling cycle and different building blocks, you're going to have some that might not couple at all at minus 20, and you might have some, if you don't go to minus 35, where they're going to already go bad before you do anything. And so far, the last 20 years, we have had exactly that. We have the same coupling cycle for every building block. And it still worked pretty well. But of course, you also waste a lot of building block. So what we want in the future is we want to have a program that is associated with a building block and also eventually with a nucleophile. So that was important. But by doing those reactions, uh, we also realized that if we take the learnings that we made from what I just showed you, then what we have done so far is that we typically used to go to low temperature, then go up, and then go to high temperature. And somewhere in between the action happened. But we realized we're making a former under conditions to show that we got very little of what we wanted. If we went to a higher temperature, isothermal, we got almost nothing. But if we kept it at a low temperature, just around in that area where this particular building block will react, we're going to make basically exclusively what we want. So it shows you that temperature is immensely, immensely important. I control the temperature with my synthesizer. Unfortunately, that is not the entire story. Because I had a new PhD student, my Hu Lin from Taiwan, and she came in and I said, look, follow up on the work by Owen Tuck, and let's have a look at that. And this is unpublished data, um, which we're going to submit pretty soon, and this is really, really concerning for people who do carbohydrate chemistry. That is probably the reason why it's been so bad. Because what my Hu did is she looked at different water content. So usually we have pretty dry solvents, 23 ppm water, and we can make super dry solvents, 1 ppm water. And the reason we did this experiment is because in Germany, in August and September, we never got good results. My students have already claimed they want to have a Betriebsferien, so basically a vacation of the entire institute for, for eight weeks. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of that, right? So I said, look, we need to understand what's going on here. And um, so we asked May, I said, look, take a look at this. We know, of course, if you have too much water in a glycosylation, you're going to get hydrolysis. That's trivial, okay? That's not what I'm talking about here. But what we realized is that when we had a little bit of water, the activation temperature was much lower than if it was um, less water. And that is from, I'd say, on average, a 15 degree difference. So if you program your synthesizer to give a certain temperature to run the reaction, depending on how much water you have in there, you may be completely <coughs> out of the sweet spot of what your, of your chemistry is going to do. And this is why our students in the old days had such problems. Because one student would go to a still, immediately do the reaction, and maybe 1 ppm, the next student would wait a little bit, or it was a humid day, or he was messing, or she was messing around a little bit with the reaction, had more water, and all of a sudden it worked differently. And this is why we used to do the temperature ramp, because somehow we start here, and then we go there, and somewhere in between it happens, okay? Unfortunately, that's not science, that's more like cooking, okay? Which is also fine, but not in this case. So, that is a problem, and what we did then is we, we transformed what we did here on the synthesizer, that's actually fantastically repeatable. But it gets a little worse even than that. Because what we have is we don't just have water in there, you also have an activator. This NIS, triplic acid, um, and what we realize is depending on the equivalents we're using, we can have an activation temperature of minus 8 or an activation temperature below minus 35. So the concentration of the acid also plays a big role. And that is a problem because some students, they think, oh, I make a big molecule, let me use more building block or use more activator. And some students will say, oh, I just double up, give it work much better. That may be because they actually changed the temperature and they got the sweet spot straightened out. So what we realize now is we have to totally and utterly control the reaction because otherwise it's going to be a big mess. And this has been a whole problem of carbohydrate chemistry. And the only way you're going to find this is we actually start to really systematically automate this to see what's going on. What uh, Mahoui has done in the recent past now is that she actually showed that if you go to the right conditions, you don't have to cool down to minus 20 anymore. 
we can't do the uh, reaction actually at zero degrees. And that makes a huge difference for my engineers because we don't have to pull our reaction from um, room temperature down to minus 25, minus 30, go back up again. Now we go almost in the area of ambient temperature. So that is again important from my automation standpoint. So we all message from this whole long-winded discussion I have here is, if you understand the reaction, it's actually easier to do it afterwards. So that's what we did here. So, synthesizer, beginning, we sold it slowly because it was expensive. Now it's going much, much faster. Um, as I said, this is still the prototype where a new one is going to go out to us, and already there are five other people that um, bought it now because the price is going to come down. And I can say the goal, of course, is to bring the price down close to where peptide synthesizers are. Um, it's a little more complicated right now, but I think Slowly, slowly, this is actually starting to pick up the technology. So, my whole long-winded presentation here <coughs> had one simple um, argument. And the argument was, look, we are great, we can make carbohydrates, and what we can do with it. So there are many things you can do. You can put it on surfaces, and you can do labeled carbohydrates, and chemoenzymatic cylinders, enzymatic assays. Today, I will talk a little bit, and briefly only, about glycoconjugates, and a little bit about carbohydrate materials. Now, um, I should say that making carbohydrates can be useful. Uh, this was fun. A Danish group came to us and they said, well, we think we have a new binding pocket for the LDL receptor. Uh, we published one paper and they started a company and raised 30 million euros out of that. And they actually got to the clinic. So I remember saying, ah, I don't know, it's stupid, we just can make a bunch of carbohydrates, but it worked out okay. Uh, then we make sometimes standards for people who do crystallography, or we do electron microscopy, um, or we work with people in immunology. So that's I'm trying to say is with carbohydrates, you can do molecular glycobiology, just you can do molecular biology. I think you all realize by now, now, I don't really do anything new. I just look for people that did peptide chemistry or did DNA chemistry, and I try to do the same thing for carbohydrates. That's really our inspiration. But one thing that bothers me is that if you think about what people have done with our biopolymers, they A, they understand how they fold. You know? Beta sheets, alpha helices, double helix. And then they come and they create new molecules. This whole area of DNA origami, all based on synthetic um, DNA. And carbohydrates, they have no idea. We don't know how they fold, how they behave, what's going on. And um, branch systems, flexible structures, total mess. So what we need to do is we understand how do carbohydrates behave. And what I try to do is I try to bring experts in the analytical sciences to the field. And I convinced Kevin Parker, by the way, the first PhD student of my wife, and he um, showed me ion mobility mass spectrometry, which is basically a gas phase HPLC. You put your molecules in a gas phase, you push them through a uh, drift gas, and if your molecule is fat, it's going to interact with a lot of um, other um, um, things. If it's broad, it's going to interact a lot, it's going to come out later. If it's small and, and compact, it's going to come out faster. That allows us to really understand the shape um, of carbohydrates. I showed a picture earlier, um, and what also was useful for us was gas phase IR spectroscopy, also with Kevin Page. And I remember when he showed me this, I said, what, IR spectroscopy? That's totally useless. Okay, sorry if I don't offend, offend anybody. But like, I mean, for carbohydrates, uh, that's what we get, right? Glucose at 300K, nothing. Because they are, Peter, because you don't understand what you're doing. Uh, if you go to 0.3 Kelvin, all of a sudden you get actually diagnostic peaks. And if you work with theoreticians and with people in spectroscopy, you've been able to use that in the gas phase very nicely. Of course, you can say, well, it's only gas phase. What the hell does it mean? You're correct, but it gives us interesting results. Another area of interest was in collaboration with my colleague Klaus Kahn and Max Planck for solid state research and his former colleague uh, Stefan Rauschmann, now professor at Oxford. And what they had done is they had developed technologies to look at single molecules to image them. And the experiment is the following. You take a molecule, in our case a carbohydrate, you put it for electrospray, Go down a um, quadrupole um, filter, take out what you want, go via a time of flight mass spectrometer, and then you slap a molecule against the surface. The surface is copper, it's cold at 120 Kelvin, it gets even colder, and you put a thing flat, and then you've got to take your scanning tongue in microscopy, STM tip, and you've got to image this whole thing. And so what I said is, well, you've done it for peptides, you have to done it for DNA, do it for carbohydrates. Turns out it was not so easy. It took two years to actually adjust all the parameters. The results we got from that was quite nice. This is a single um, carbohydrate. Now you can see the arms here, single uh, molecule we can image. And um, <coughs> what we could show is that, for example, a pentamanocyte looks extended, hexaglucose so can be extended, can also be um, circular. So that was nice because for the first time you actually see what these things look like. And then we got some 
um, pretty interesting results. For example, we had this molecule here. This is a linear piece of cellulose, if you will, beta 1 for glucose. And we would expect this to be linear, right? But then we saw it also cyclic. And I talked to his other about it, and he goes, well, that makes a lot of sense because that is the lowest energy conformation in the gas phase. Right, okay, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> I'm just a biochemist, right? So they know this. Like, okay, that's interesting. So that's basically like cyclodextrin. The only problem is cyclodextrin has one extra bond, and that's from here to here. This thing does not. So then you now actually use your SDM tip. Your SDM tip, and you tip on this thing, it snaps open and goes then to the uh, low energy conformer on the salt phase. That uh, can be done. So basically, you can see really all the different. Um, Phases here, and you can also do the calculations, and the calculation actually is in agreement with the experiment here. So now you can start to see actually single molecules um, on the surface here. Now, uh, this is Giulio Fitolani, who works for Martina Del Bianco, one of the group leaders in our materials um, group here. And he again made a whole series of these uh, celluloses. And I should say, this entire group, this entire group was only started because of an accident. Martina Del Bianco was a postdoc in my department, she came from Durham. And her job was to make labeled hexasaccharides of cellulose. And she made them on the automated synthesizer, she deprotected them, and she got nothing. She did it again, and she got nothing. So then for me as a PI, there's no two choices, right? Either I have a really stupid postdoc here that doesn't know what she's doing, <laughs> uh, or something really weird is going on. So she didn't make a really stupid impression on me, and you know her, right? She's very good. And so what we realized is that something funky is going on. Because actually, as you take the protect groups off, this material crystallizes out. It doesn't crystallize to a pentasaccharide, but once it gets longer, it crystallizes out. Okay, so now it's interesting because now I can think about maybe I can actually make the cyanide cellulose. I make specific pieces of cellulose, and I refer to Martina's work. I mean, she has done a tremendous job in this area, and you can actually build structures from first principles. Why do the trees outside stand? Because cellulose forms bundles, cellulose interacts. And now we can actually start, not building trees, but building actually uh, cellulose pieces by one molecule to the next. But understanding really fundamentally what's going on as chemists, we can actually make changes by changing a hydroxyl for nothing, deoxy, or for fluorine or whatever. And you can really begin to understand every single interaction in a very um, specific way. Together with Yuo Gawa, who's going to join um, the department next to mine uh, pretty soon, um, Julie was able to actually take a close look at that with X-ray. What they have been able to do is then to really understand um, how these um, how these piles assemble. Actually, in, in those cases, you can take a top view or the thickness. Um, in this case, and uh, what they did is that they take D cellulose, they got a right-handed bundle that's uh, coming together, and then we made the um, L cellulose. That's something you don't typically see, and then you start getting left-handed bundles. So basically, depending on the sugar you use, you're going to get different um, chiralities. And again, that's something you couldn't do. Uh, by isolating uh, molecules. Of course, now we can say, well, people do protein design because they know, okay, there are peptide sheet models, anti-parallel, parallel, there are turns, there are strands, and people build structures. I told you we never think of anything new, so we said, okay, how about we start building with carbohydrates? And the turn we could make from this motif here, Lewis X it's called, the blood group, shown here, cellulose, a dense network gives us strands. So how about we build a strand from cellulose and put a turn unit in? And uh, indeed, I was I would show it to you. You can uh, make that unlabeled. These NMRs were all taken down uh, the street in uh, Bilbao in Jesus' department. With Anna Paveda, they've done this. Uh, this is the nine were shown here. So now you have a strand plus the turn in this case, and. Um, you can also label that C13, labeled by synthetic chemistry, and you can then build models and you can actually get very nice pictures. So this has been forever in a very major journal and I hope one of these years now it's actually going to be accepted, should be very close, but I'm trying to tell you is, if you can build materials, you can study the properties and I think we're going to be able to build designer carbohydrates in the future and actually make quite large structures. Now, you can go even further because it's known that in nature, amylose is a 1,4 glucan, forms a helix, Kirtland, it's 1,3, different linkage, also forms some sort of structures. And 1,6, um, beta glucan, that's also Martina's work as a postdoc, um, forms these sort of weirdo structures. So, an outstanding, outstanding postdoc, <coughs> Dr. Manuel Garcia Ricardo uh, from uh, Cuba, got his PhD in Germany, 
with one of the Apple top guys. If you, you hire somebody, I think that is your man for you here. Um, really fantastic guy. He said, okay, I, we come from peptide chemistry. Um, he said, okay, in peptide chemistry, what people do is they build structures by basically um, cyclizing, and that's called stapled peptides. He said, how about we gonna make stapled carbohydrates? Um, so how are we gonna do that? We're gonna think about taking building blocks by automatic like an assembly with uh, something in the side chain here. When we build our molecule, we have to do it in such a way where the sign should bring in close proximity the two um, alkenes, and then we can do ring closing metathesis, and we can actually build uh, the entire chain, and then we can do deep protection. With deep protection, we also gonna reduce uh, this double bond uh, here, and we're gonna have um, our stapled carbohydrate. So that was a plan. That was all um, Manuel's idea. I said, okay, go to the lab, try to do it, and it worked fantastic, I should say. He made all these different things with shorter linkers and um, longer linkers out here. Of course, one thing to make it, you can publish probably, I said, well, do we have any use at all? So we thought about, okay, what use could they have? Of course, you can look structurally at them, and we have done this also in the past, and that shows you before you think about use, what are you actually doing? So this is a single molecule, the one that is not linked, and this is now a stable one, you can even See if you take a look closely, even a stable around here. So that's a beautiful technology where you actually start to see the molecules. So what we showed is that membrane permeabilization goes up if you put this in there. So you can actually deliver carbohydrates better. Maybe use it for that. You can also increase the enzymatic stability of a carbohydrate, and you can improve receptor binding. I will just show uh, because of time reasons here enzymatic stability. We compare three things. The unlinked um, one, the one where we have only alkyl shades not linked, and the stable one. And what you can see here is that if you um, have only the alkyls, you get a little more half life, but if you stable it, the half life of the molecule gets much larger. Why is that going to be good? I don't know yet, but what we see is very simple, similar to um, peptide chemistry, we can do the same sorts of things. Now, um, I usually come to uh, San Sebastian every two years to Marsans. Uh, Marsans. Um, laboratory and um, there's one of the colleagues on the advisor board is Sam Stop and Sam Stop of course has made all these um, amp amplifiers. Um, they used to make a flexible tail, a beta sheet peptide, a polar head and uh, so we thought well maybe that sounds pretty good, it could be interesting to build such beautiful structures as all his work, Sam's work and Sam uses that then for prosthetics and all sorts of ideas and he said well in nature the polar head usually is a carbohydrate so maybe you should try to think about doing something about this. And again, you have to synthesize things. And uh, Manuel uh, Garcia um, then combined carbohydrate chemistry with peptide chemistry and with lipid chemistry. And he made these um, synthetic um, peptidoglycolipids um, and deprotected them. And those are now molecules you are starting to actually build nanostructures with. So I think nowadays you can really combine pretty much anything. Speaking of combining anything, Something we work on right now, and we are getting very, very close, is trying to combine HEA with peptide chemistry. Sounds maybe really sim uh, simple at the first uh, try. The problem is you lose a lot of acid over here, you lose a lot of base over here, and that's an engineering problem because acid and base come together, they form salts, and then everything clocks, and that's a mess. We are very close, and the goal that I've given out to my uh, postdocs and students is they should make erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is a glycosylated um, protein. Um, it's used for cancer patients worldwide. It's usually pegylated. Daniszewski made it, and I think he had a group of about 15 postdocs working for 10 years. And I said, we want to make this by automation. It will also take us some time, but if you can do that, this will open the entire area of synthetic um, glycoproteins. We are not quite there, but we're getting there. Okay, so now for biological part, and I promise it won't be too long. In this case, I'm not exactly sure of time. I think we have a few minutes. I told you in the beginning, we are all surrounded by carbohydrates, and if you look at mammalian surface, it's a little bit like this. We have only 10 different ones, 10 different carbohydrates, okay? It's a little boring. You go to bacteria, they look perverted bastards, they got, <laughs> they got all sorts of stuff on there, right? Lots and lots of carbohydrates. And this is great, because that means that if a bacterium enters our body, it has different carbohydrates. And if our body can recognize that different carbohydrate and kill that bacterium, then you have a chance to make a vaccine or a treatment. Very, very simple. It's actually been known for a long time. This was developed in the 1920s and 1930s of the last century. 
And today there are three conjugate vaccines which are on the market, and I would say at least some of the people in the audience have been vaccinated, because in Europe it's been used since 1992 against the bug, it's called Haemophilus influenza type B. Many of you have never heard of it probably, and that's good, because if a child gets this, there can be extremely bad problems, and up to 50% of the children will die from it. In Europe, the United States, everybody's vaccinated, but still many parts of the country, uh, world, this is not used. Meningitis, and then streptococcus pneumonia, of course, that was one of the major killers during um, the COVID pandemic because people get sick. Then they get COVID, huge problem. I put the numbers here because the numbers are important. I've worked on vaccines for over 20 years. In the beginning, people used to tell me, Peter, look, vaccines, why are you wasting your time? Nobody cares. You can't make any money. Work on small molecules. Small molecules are good. Vaccines are bad, stupid, waste of time. Then came this blockbuster, makes over six billion right now. And all of a sudden people say, oh, vaccines, great, you can make money, it's wonderful. And what I realized is if you want to make a drug, you've got to do it in an area where people can make money because they don't get the money back, they're not going to make it. And as was mentioned, I worked on malaria for so many years, and the fact is, nobody cares. We all talk about, oh, yeah, we should help people. This is a problem we could solve easily. I have worked on other things. This is a solved problem, basically. It's a financial issue. So you've got to work on stuff that people can actually sell. Okay. So I told you, we're going to have to educate our immune system to recognize the bacterium or a parasite or a virus. And I told you that carbohydrates are around that bacterium. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take a carbohydrate, polysaccharide, and we're gonna present it to the immune system. The promise that children under the age of two and adults above about 65 with a decreasing immune system don't recognize carbohydrates as foreign. And that is why these conjugate vaccines are made where you take a carrier protein, such as diphtheria toxoid, or tetanus toxoid, and then your body says, ah, I know this, I'm going to make an immune response, and while I'm at it, I'm also recognizing the polysaccharide. Those are conjugate vaccines. And they're very simple to make. All you got to do is grow bacteria, harvest them, and purify them. Uh, very difficult. The Pratna vaccine is the most difficult drug that's being made today. It's extremely difficult, extremely lengthy. To make a vaccine batch takes a year and a half. Because many bacteria don't like to grow, and many bacteria don't like to get their carbohydrates purified. It's very, very challenging. And so the idea that many people had, including myself, of course, is to say, well, you know, we are synthetic chemists. Let's just make a synthetic carbohydrate, and maybe take a carrier that's no longer a protein, and maybe it's self-attributing, so we don't need to attribute anymore. And maybe we can even do it in such a way we don't have to inject because of nasal or oral delivery. And that was not a new idea. That's when, as a postdoc, we worked on these things already. But it's been very difficult because the people in the industry, all the people in vaccine companies are biologists. And they say, look, this is what we do. We have these big stainless steel reactors, they're expensive. And we make these drugs. And chemistry, chemistry is way too expensive. You can never compete with us. Total nonsense. One of my former postdocs, now in a company, Vaxelon, these two guys here, <coughs> made in um, eight weeks, about two grams, plus a million doses. The cost per dose is between 1 and 10 cents. It's much cheaper than what else can be made. And I mention these things because people didn't do this because they were under impression, oh, this can't be done. If the large pharma companies, and you know them all, and they all have vaccine uh, parts, if they would have said, we're going to lose my synthesis, I would have been out of business 20 years ago. Luckily for me, they didn't do this, okay? So that gave us a chance to try to do something here. Okay, so how are we going to develop a vaccine? First thing, we're going to pick a disease. The disease should be bad. I mean, I want a disease that's bad, okay? It should kill a lot of people because otherwise, if I make a vaccine that nobody needs, waste of time. Then I'm going to go down to the hospital. I'm going to look for patient samples. And that sounds easy. That is today the limiting factor for us. Because not only do I need patient samples, I need approval that I can use the patient samples, which is a nightmare. I need well characterized patient samples. So we dig through the freezer space down. There can be blood, there can be stool. Not so fun, but something can do it. Then we're going to make the carbohydrates from the surface. We're going to make a, take an array, and on that array, we're going to screen those samples whether these people actually made antibodies. From that, we pick out a um, lead carbohydrate, we conjugate it to a carrier protein, and then we introduce it into animals. Now I show a mouse here, and in my institute, I have mice and I have rats, but we now go more and more to rabbits and actually most recently to pigs. 
Unsurprisingly, pigs are very similar to humans. In many regards, the problem is pigs are big and they eat a lot. And so they cost a lot more. That's why you don't like it so much. Otherwise, oh, they're great, okay? Um, but uh, what we then do is we inject the animals. We do the initial evaluation using glycan arrays and SPR, so the plasma resonance. Then we take the serum. And we take the serum. What we want to know is can the serum from the animals, can that serum kill bacteria? If that's the case, that's good. Then comes the important experiment. We're going to take two groups of animals. Some that are going to get the real vaccine and some that get everything but the carbohydrate. And then, of course, the ones that get vaccinated should live and the other ones should die, ideally. Now, a lot of people are against animal experiments. I'm not a big fan either, but it's still better than using my kids to do that, so that's why we use animals, okay? So, at that stage, we can publish a nice paper, and that's great. But I don't like that, okay? I want to go, actually, to clinical development. And unfortunately, even Max Planck, this is very, it's tough for us. And so we had to go to preclinical development, clinical development with industrial partners. The large companies didn't want to do it because they said, ah, this is too expensive, we can't do it. And so we were forced at some point to say, okay, we're going to start our own company. And we started a company, as we mentioned, I've started a few of them. Um, nine of them have been successful so far. And we started this one and we raised 30 million euros in the first round in 2015. And they focused on two things, CDIF and Klebsiella. Um, believe me, you don't want either one of them, they're not good, okay? This worked so well that in 2020, Idorsia, a large Swiss company, actually um, bought us out. And they developed this now, and this is actually both of them are in the clinic um, going forward. Again, just for your knowledge, to develop a vaccine will take you somewhere about 15 years to do. So we're about seven years in now, so about halfway is there, I think, but still, knocking on wood, it seems to go pretty well. We have used the same thing for many other things. I won't go into the details now because that would be way too boring for you. One of the latest things is uh, for pigs. Next week, we're going to go, actually, we've been with patients for two weeks already because then you can go directly to patients. And the reason we want to immunize pigs is because the veterinary industry uses tons of antibiotics. If you could vaccinate the animals, we wouldn't use antibiotics anymore and because the, the vaccines are cheap. We could actually um, do this. Um, how are we doing on time? Is it okay? 10 minutes? Sorry. Yeah. Five minutes. Five. Okay. Then we can faster. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to go through the details here. This would have just told you how to make diagnostics. I want to go to something to when you go home for lunch and dinner tonight, when you're going to brush your teeth, okay? <laughs> because we wanted to make a vaccine against um, P. gingivalis, Pheromonas gingivalis, and uh, that causes periodontitis and it's a problem. And one of my students said, That's, I want to work on that, I want to work on a vaccine for this. And what's in the literature is um, the fact that apparently it has something to do with arthrosclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and also potential Alzheimer's. I should say, this is totally controversial, okay? And I don't know the first thing about Alzheimer's. Um, so, what my student said is, she said, okay, maybe we can make a vaccine and maybe we can just prevent this because people that have that, it's a huge problem. They can lose the entire bone. The entire bone can be gone. And so let's, said, okay, let's make a vaccine against this. And she made a whole bunch of structures. And the problem is I cannot show you the structures for reasons that have become obvious in just a second. And we made a structure and we started looking at glycan arrays and what we found is, we looked at glycan arrays from serum of people and from saliva of patients. And what we found is that people that had been, vac that had, had a disease and recovered had antibodies against specific glycans. So they were apparently protected. Those who had a disease very badly had no antibodies. So that shows that our human body can make antibodies against carbohydrates, and if we make it, they can be protected. That's great, which means we can make a vaccine against this disease. But then my student said, okay, that's interesting because this whole Alzheimer thing comes up. So maybe let's take a look at the cerebral spinal fluid from Alzheimer patients. And we did that because we had done a similar study previously with multiple sclerosis. And we found and published a couple of years ago that people with multiple sclerosis have antibodies in their nerve system against uh, bacteria from the gut. So some make antibodies against their gut uh, microbiota and that stuff shows up in their brain. So then we said maybe the same thing is true for Alzheimer. It actually turns out what we found now is that these Alzheimer patients have serious levels of antibodies against some of these glycans. That could mean a tremendous progress. I'm very careful about this because we have done this so far, I think, on 50, 80 patients. I have just another 300 patients now coming in samples from different clinical centers, and other students are now repeating the experiment completely blind because if this is true, it's a very big deal, and we keep our fingers crossed, but 
What we are doing at the same time, we have started to immunize animals with these uh, carbohydrates, and the hope is, of course, to vaccinate people against this dental disease. And if there's a connection to Alzheimer, of course, that would be very, very interesting um, to know. It was said in the beginning, I show this because it shows STD NMR, Jesus, it's important NMR, and I show this for the students for a very specific reason. We made this tetrasaccharide that's on the surface anthrax in 2005. It was just a synthetic curiosity. We published it, and then the immunologists came and said, can we make antibodies? Yeah, sure, let's make antibodies. I didn't know that at the time yet myself. So we made antibodies, published with Nangevan in 2006. And then this was on radio and TV because uh, anthrax was a big deal at that time. I was an ETH, so a professor in Switzerland. I got a visit from the Swiss Army. I said, Professor Sieberg, have you heard you have an antibody against anthrax? Do you like to make a detection kit out of that? I said, what, in Switzerland? Why would you do that? They said, in Switzerland, every time an idiot drops a white powder at a train station, we have to use an antibody detection kit from the United States, and that costs 50 Swiss francs. And we want our own kit. I said, well, go ahead, do it, okay. Um, we made antibodies, we characterized the antibodies, interesting uh, binding epitope, quite large. And that eventually was developed into a test kit, and it's now sold to all the Western armies, actually also the Russian army, for what I understand. The other thing I should say to the students, these guys never paid a single penny in royalties on a patent which were licensed from ETH, which is a travesty, but that's a different story. But I'm just showing that by services you can make stuff which eventually can be a test kit. Um, we also made antibodies in all sorts of other things because we want to make um, antibodies against cancer. I think there will be no vaccine against cancer. I think there will be antibodies against cancer. And just as a little aside, in this case, I thought it would be fun. This company um, really wanted to make antibodies. It's very, very hard to do that. And what they ended up doing is they started to work in all kinds of animals, including llamas. My lab has five llamas, which we have outside Brandenburg. They're in a petting zoo. They're very well treated. All we do is we just inject them one time, we take some blood. So nothing really happens to them. They use chicken, cow, frog. And one of the group leaders actually wanted to have sharks. But that's where I drew a line. I said, no sharks are left with okay? <laughs> so anyway, this is now moving forward. The company's doing very well. They're going to use that, I think, um, in cancer. So with that, I come to the end. I try to tell you that um, we developed our make glycan assembly. We eventually made synthesizers and building blocks available. We make more and more complex carbohydrates, which we need to use for material science. We can do imaging. We have microarray platforms. We have more clonal antibodies. We work on um, sort of congenital disorders of plaque isolation, and we're working on vaccines. Jesus ruined it for me a little bit because he told you already mm -hmm. that um, I didn't know this. Um, that um, during COVID, I was a little bored. And uh, the government asked me to write a proposal. I didn't really want to do that. But finally, they gave us a lot of money. And we're supposed to build this uh, new center. This is an old sugar factory, actually, which I found as funny as a couple of Americans um, <laughs> outside of Leipzig. Uh, and I should also say, we developed this idea in February, March of last year, long before this whole Ukraine crisis came about. And I developed this because I thought it would be important for us to go away from a situation today where we use fossil fuels. Unfortunately, the last year now has shown us very clearly why we have to get away from this, but this proposal is way underway before this all happened. I think we're going to go to a situation we're going to start things in recycling. We're going to go through cycles. We're going to develop new chemistry, catalysis, engineering, everything else is going to be an important point. That's what we want to do. It's not going to be an easy task. I think it's going to take everybody. It's going to take all of you colleagues, but we're going to go in this direction. Um, what we really did is we built an approach that focuses very strong on automation and standardization. Artificial intelligence will play an increasing role. We have to catch up 170 years of chemical development in the future. Recycling will be important, renewable feedstocks, but what's also important, we're going to have to talk to society, we're going to have to make economic uh, solutions, and we're going to get acceptance for chemistry, because we as chemists often view it as the ones who create all the problems. I don't think so. I think we actually solve the problems, and we're going to be the solution to the future, I think, for the young students. This is the future. I think this is where it's going to go. We're going to have um, the solution, not anytime soon, but uh, we're going to have to work on them. The good thing is that we have basically the entire chemical industry of Germany behind us. This was early on, 120 companies, now we get many more. The interesting part is that places like such as BMW, they promise they're going to make completely recyclable cars by 2035. These are purely chemical problems. The paint, the insulation, all the plastics, all have to be changed. We have places like Microsoft in there, artificial intelligence. They're going to build a building next to us with 60 people. We can have big German construction companies in there, big recycling companies. Finally, they're all coming together. And we're having an international network, MIT, Oxford, and so on. 
I bring this up here because I think we're partners in Spain. We believe this can only be solved together, and we invite you um, to work on this because I think even an institution of a thousand people won't be able to make a difference. This can only be done by the best and brightest. I know very little about all this. I just thought it would be cool to do that because as chemists we can do whatever. No chemical institution in Germany, large institutions, only medical institutes and uh, institutes of large physics institutes. And so this is the first chemical one. The bad thing about this is I got the money and I'm supposed to run this thing now and now I'm going to probably spend more and more time in administration, unfortunately. But that's the way it's going to go, I think. So with that, I think the people who did the work, as always, uh, I travel most of the time, this was already pointed out beforehand. Uh, this is materials group, we just saw a few slides. Matilda Danko is a typical example of what happens. Max Planck, we have these group leaders, they run their own show, they do their own thing. 68 of my former co workers have become professors in the past, which is going to be probably one of the next ones, from what we understand. Um, some people are very interested, that's good. Um, and these are the guys who actually work with me. My own group has um, shrunk somewhat. I have these two groups, automation. Um, and vaccines you can see here, typical group, India, Vietnam, China, um, Venezuela, United States, um, Cuba, Taiwan, Germany, Ireland, and so on and so forth. So you see these are people from all over the place. Um, same would be here, actually from Spain, Patricia Frigué, one of our uh, key immunologists. She's going to be ready, I think, in about a year. If you need somebody really good to come back to Spain, she'd be um, fantastic. And of course, if people are interested in chemistry or biology, you'd like to come to Max Planck, Send us an email, we're always interested in getting people. With that, I'd like to thank the taxpayers, the German taxpayers who give us money, Europeans, thank you. You also gave me ERC money, but that's already a couple of years ago. These are electronic means by which you can contact me, but since I'm here, maybe just ask a question. With that, thanks again very, very much, all of you, for, um, yeah, first of all, inviting me to come here. Big honor for me, very big honor. Thank you very much. And thanks very much for coming this morning and uh, staying awake for all the talk. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>